My name is Nadia Simpson. I'm standing um, on the Beedigal lands uh, in Sydney's inner southern western suburb, and I want to pay my respects to the songs of this place and the song lines that are connecting us all uh, and pay respects to the elders, um, the spirit and the countries of wherever you are listening uh, and speaking on today. Um, I am joined today by um, my great friends and mentors, Brenda Gifford, Tim Gray, Troy Russell and Artie Marlene Cummins, who are strong cultural people. And we're going to yarn a little bit about the work that they make, the way that they make it, and how they send their work out to be received by others. So we've all been musicians and now composers together at the same time. Uh, all of us have been uh, participants in Naraburia composers, First Nation composers. And I'm going to kick off asking you, Aunty Marlene, a question about Naraburia. I know that you are an institution in Australian music. Forget Blackfella music. You, you're, the, you're the queen. And we've moved into this sort of way of uh, writing, notating, thinking about different instruments. Uh, and I wanted to ask you if you could tell me a little bit about how Naraburia, the First Nations um, Composers Initiative, how it's impacted on your creative career so far. Well, it, actually, it's impacted me on me in a way that's taken me into a, another um, zone that I find very exciting, very um, stimulating as far as it goes with my growth. Um, my personal growth. I. It, it's funny when I think about it. I. Um, I listen to a classical at home. I listen, and I. I'm always thinking in my head, um, not realizing I am computing all the while, and because uh, I have got a very good ear because I grew up around live music all my life as a small. My father always said the best musicians are the versatile musicians. Your audience is your barometer. And so little did I realise, I did actually inherit that from my father growing up around us. He could play jazz, blues, rock and roll, anything. And it, it was almost like, well, yeah, this is, this is right. I hadn't realised till I was exposed to it all. And, and, and I got really excited. I had to uh, stop myself from... Uh, talking and asking so many questions when we had the workshop, you know, you can't overkill anybody, uh, give anybody else a bit of a uh, 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 look into, you know. I was just excited just to talk and listen with these amazing musicians, be it the, the flutes and the violins and the... Um, What's that thing? I always think of them. Vibraphone. I just, I, I've been working with the vibraphone players since, but I just say, oh, that ding dong thing. <laughs> and um, yeah, and that that big. What's that other one now? I've forgotten the name of that. It's like a saxophone, but it, oh, it's a bass clarinet. That's right. Mm. <laughs> and when you go up to the top register, you can play. In the register of alto saxophone. Mm. Beautiful. I mean, when you in your response, I'm I'm hearing you talk about a new kind of way of music, but it's also but also saying that you knew this already through your father, through uh, a bass clarinet to sounding like a saxophone. It's a beautiful yeah. thing to think, and I reckon maybe that that's culture, how culture works, you know and music and art and creativity and the dreaming that even though we're learning things our history in this place means that we've come across this in in other ways it seems familiar to us um, yeah. and it makes me wonder you know um brenda moving on to you and thinking about to me you've been uh, the vanguard of black women composers 
because for as long as I've been understanding black music, you've been making it. Same with Annie Marlene. But for me, you were the first person that I, you were the first black composer I ever knew. And you have a long history with this kind of stuff. And I would really love to kind of hear you talk about um, the practices or habits that you have that feed your creativity, that feed the making of um, compositions. Yeah, could you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, Nadi. Um, yeah, just kind of touching on um, what Marley was saying. Um, I think um, coming from, you know, playing saxophones, um, playing tenor, um, and that range, like Marlon was talking about keys and ranges and that with the, um, what is it called, the bass clarinet, um, it's that idea that actually um, comes into your writing because I'm used to hearing the lower ranges, like, um, you know, soprano, tenor, that stuff, um, used to hearing the lower ranges and that's just how I hear it. Um, the other thing is when I say, you know, that's how I hear it, um, if I can't hear it, then um, if I can't hear it in my head, um, then I can't write it. So, I'll give you an example: writing for this um, what do you call them? the Tasmanian Orchestra, the bloody huge, you know, whatever, fifty, sixty. I couldn't hear it. I'm, I can hear a twelve-piece ensemble or ten-piece or duo. I can hear that, but it took me a long time. <laughs> A long time to get my head around it and bloody draft upon draft of getting something in the end result. But it took me about a year to actually get my head around it. But anyway, so the other thing is like those things like going for walks, you know, kind of um, going for walks, trying to get, you know, um, near water. Um, I find that, just, you know, especially with... You know, when we're writing stuff and we're spending so much time on computers these days and bloody Zooms and all this. And the lovely thing is, even though Sibelius and I have a love-hate relationship, um, I can hear it back. So as long as I can, you know, do, and, um, and I think I've talked to Troy about this. <laughs> tried to do, I'm um, technically challenged. I've tried to do the MIDI thing because my thing is I can, you know, do jazz stuff and just do build out the chords and then, you know, from a chord progression I'll say, oh, that works, that doesn't, you know, it might do like five or ten minutes of just, you know, I'm vamping on an idea. Then from that I might take, you know, like um, if it's ten minutes I might, five will be crap and five will be, you know, you can use it. The long and short is um, just having a break, kind of getting away from the screen. And, I'll, you know, there's a lot to be said for a cup of tea and a pot. So it's interesting to see how, the, how, you know, making and creating needs a balance of not doing that and sounding like we're going for a walk, then around the water or sort of centering and slowing down and giving your ears a rest, eh? Always helps. Um, and for yeah, you, you yeah. hear music and not voices in your head. Well, that's a good thing. <laughs> it's when they start actually back. So, um, yeah. Well, that'll be a piece we can't wait to hear. Let me tell you. When uh, the ladies are talking, boys, and I realise we're seriously outnumbered here. There's two saxophones. We're outnumbered by saxophones. Yeah. But I wanted to ask um, you, Tim, because you're always good with advice, you know, Russ. You're, you're a deadly advice giver. And you're very calm, and you thought you think through things. So I reckon you'll have a you'll have a, a deadly answer to this question. Uh, if I could pick your brains, you probably you know when I talk, I talk too much, so you're probably thinking, oh, not again. If I could pick your brains of the people that you draw inspiration from, who have you got sitting at your kitchen table with a brewed pot of tea? Uh, there to have a yarn with about making? Because the first person that came to mind was Bob Marley. Um, you know I'm a bit of a Bob Marley fan. <laughs> and, you know, 
Why well, I say Bob Marley? It's not just Bob Marley. It's the, just the reggae scene and it's the Whalers. And you know, Brenda was talking about hearing things. I uh, what what composition has done? It's really opened up. Really, I'm really starting to learn how to really listen to things. So, take the Whalers for example, right? So you got about twenty people on stage. You know, they're all doing, you know, you've got the regular uh, instruments and singing. But then you've got one guy just on the triangle, right? And he might only play that four times in the whole song. But that, that means something, right? Then you've got some guy with a clacker or whatever they call those things. You know what I mean? There's always someone. And then there's someone just strumming this little tiny harp thing. It's all in this one <coughs> reggae song. You know, things like that. Now that I noticed. See, before I didn't notice, all I noticed was Bob Marley's lyrics, his message, which is powerful, obviously. So things like that, and then I go to, because you all know I love it. Almost every piece that I write is based around film. <laughs> Whatever I've heard in movies, I live. I live in a movie. <laughs> that's, that's how I describe it. I just love, if I could live at the cinema, I would, but it's just not uh, plausible. <laughs> That's why I'm, this COVID, I'm really missing the film. Anyway, so film school, you know, I love film school. And I, I watched this YouTube clip of, of uh, John Williams conducting the Jaws thing for an orchestra. And, you know, when I was a kid, all I heard was the, 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 that's all I heard. The, and for years, that's all I heard was those two little words, E and F. But when I was watching this, uh, you know, with composition, watching this, Film school orchestra. I could hear, you heard all these other stuff. They got oboes, they got bass clarinets. You know, there's all this, not just the dirt, dirt, that's not the Jaws thing. I mean, that's the premise of the Jaws thing. But there's so many other things going on to, you know, to get everyone from stopping going to the beach (laughs) (laughs) and scared of sharks. But uh, I don't know, I'm going up a bit of a bit of a ramble here, but that's, I'm trying to describe. What influences my music? Um, so I suppose composers like John Williams, Ennio, Maricone, uh great film composers like that. The ones nowadays like Hans Zimmer. Uh, yeah. And yeah, and my, my first song was a blues song uh, that I wrote in a rehab, drug and alcohol rehab, when I was getting sober, called Namajira Haven. So, so I was, yeah, that sort of music was. I love blues. <laughs> Not the unknowing, legendary. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, blues and reggae were my thing, and classical, obviously, because I was trained <laughs> piano. So, I'd probably have Bob Marley, uh, one of those film composers. And Jules. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, and probably uh, my AA sponsor at the time. <laughs> Why do you think you're noticing triangles and clacky things yeah. now, and you, what stopped you from? noticing that before i just didn't hear it i was very singular in my in my hearing like even playing classical piano when i was young um and I even listened to film school since i was a kid all i heard was the um yeah i don't know i just couldn't just couldn't hear it and i think probably watching it too actually opens it up as well you know you know watching the film jaws you don't see all the other instruments but watching that youtube clip with john williams conducting them, then you hear everything because the camera goes to the particular instrument that's playing at the time in the middle of the Jaws thing. Uh, so it's not just about the, the cellos and the violins. but And, and also, like, meeting you all um, because I'm when it comes to this group, I'm the newbie. You guys have been doing music for, <laughs> you know, long before I even thought about touching the piano. So... So these are my inspirations as well. So I definitely have you guys at the table too. And Chris Sainsbury too, by the way. <laughs> now, Troy, a man of many talents and a man of many jobs, busy fella. This one is... Um, yeah, I get bored. Uh, this one uh, is for you. Uh, I'd really like to hear your reflections on how you have this balance, work-life balance, 
Um, are there things that you say no to in your work or your life? Um, as, is there work that you say no to? And are there, how do you make those decisions? Because I know you juggle a lot of things. And most of the things, for as long as I've known you, have been community-based um, initiatives. Uh, so from my point of view, yeah. you're always, and you are like this as a player, you're always playing with other people too and always adding your um, talents to other people's work. So how do you manage to do that? Uh, do Are there things that you end up having to say, look, I can't do? And if you do do that, is there a decision-making process behind um, uh, what you choose to do or create and what you don't I don't say no to a lot because I, I, I see it as a um, – it's me challenging myself, you know. Like just recently doing the, the, this stuff for a brass quintet from the Melbourne Con. They're happy with it, by the way. They love it. But I've never done anything like that before. I've never written for that before. So luckily I've got – the technology around me here to do that. So, I, you know, I've got my iPad here that has a program on it where I can write directly to the screen and then hear that note back, you know. So I've got my MIDI keyboards and all this programming and all that. Put myself, I've ended up putting myself through it just for the, the real challenge of doing it. it um, there isn't much I would say no to really when it comes to that, you know, creativity. Mm. I've been the filmmaker. I've been the photographer. Um, I'm building cameras to have for when I'm ready to go out and shoot again. You know, this is a nice, nice camera. Yeah, I'll be happy when, it's, um, when I can go out and shoot something with it. Um, and planning, you know, I planned for making a film clip with my own, film clips with my own band once we can all get together again. And, and you know yourself, Nadi, when we worked on. Um, that piece, the last shot together. I never did anything like that before, especially having, you know, like the premise, write a script. Okay, I know what a script looks like, yeah. Without it being a musical, write a script for that and use these songs in it. So the idea for the whole thing comes from a song, which is the last song of the whole piece, the last shot, the first shot. So having you and, and Kurt working with me on that, going through those stages of building it, I'd, I'd say that was really challenging. But, but it's like I always felt good at the end of the day. I never ever felt, oh, this is going to shit, you know. And I don't think I've ever felt that way about any project that I've ever worked on where I've walked away at the end of the day again. Well, I was going to say, because like Tim was reminding me of um, when I studied film, Screen, screen um, um, composition. For more than a year, I couldn't go to see a movie because I pulled it apart. Oh, they did this lighting there, they did that. There's this shot, the wide shot going, you know, all that sort of stuff. Couldn't enjoy the, the story, you know. Yeah. But it made me like, you know, even when you're recording, there's the, there's the microscope on that particular one thing you know, and you make sure it's done right. Because I'll tell you, I started out, right, making, wanting to be a filmmaker, but learned photography to do that. Always had interest in photography. So, you know, learning how composition looks in through the lens, you know, how to see somebody. So I take a picture with my, you know, my phone. And people always go, oh, wow, that's a great photo. Yeah, because I can see how it's supposed to look, you know, not through the little viewfinder, but on the nice big screen, I go, okay, cool. Boom. I suppose it's a real honour winning a couple of awards for filmmaking. Yeah? Especially for a film that you're passionate about, and Marlene actually appears in that as a, like, in the background of a shot that I used of the Foundation for Aboriginal Affairs. Yeah, where's um, my residuals? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
Sorry, you said that. Sorry, go. That's right. Um, <laughs> and learning how to do that, and then thinking, well, you know, like filmmaking is really hard to make any money. With. You know, you're never going to make any money making documentaries, of course, you know, ever. So you know, you do it for the love, you know. So or uh, short films, you just do it for the love of filmmaking. So I thought, and you know, this is when I met Brenda. Was go and learn how to play an instrument. And I got Brenda, first time I ever come to Eora, back in Regent Street, I met Brenda. And I asked her, would she teach me how to play saxophone? So we got to the fundamentals anyway, didn't we? <laughs> and yeah. But, you know, I still remember all that stuff. You know, it's like, um, you know, all the fingering and all that sort of thing. You know, it's, that's there. But forming an embouchure these days, forget it. You know, don't have the teeth anyway. But um, going in through that and, you know, coming across students who needed a bass player for a, for a show that they were coming up to do play that Yora was putting on called Close to the Bone, I poked my head in to take some photographs and, you know, I noticed they didn't have a bass player. And I said, Are you guys looking for a bass player? They go, oh, yeah, can you play? I said, oh, yeah. No, you know, I wouldn't have bought a base. And uh, I learned it and, you know, and like learnt playing that through that show. Something changes when you compose a piece and you give it to other people to play and it's their audience. Uh, and so mm. um, it's really interesting to hear that you started um, a composition project and then thought, Maybe this wasn't for me. Mm. I'm wondering, Brenda, mm. if you, because you've had a bit more experience than us in this, have you ever decided against um, a composition work? Um, and, and if so, why? I'm just thinking about that. Um, at this stage, and kind of, um, I haven't said no, and. Um, like Troy was saying, but for me it would be depending. Now I wrote something down here because I, yeah, if it, um, I'd say no if um, it was culturally inappropriate, and that's kind of pretty broad. But, um, you know, kind of like I'm sure we've all been there kind of, you know, back in the day. That old bit, we call them mixed relays. They had offers from bloody, um, you know, Ford and all this crap, you know, the commercial stuff to do, you know, music and all that. And um, if it was kind of, you know, kind of like my thing is, um, yeah, I haven't said no yet. There's one that I'm a bit, when you say that, I'm actually thinking about it. I thought, there's one that I'm kind of like I have said yes to, but, <laughs> but I'm... Um, and I think it's age, stage and phase of your career as well. Like I'm saying yes to everything because like works, you know, works work, um, long or short. Um, but if it, yeah, if it didn't sit with me, when I say that, like it was kind of, you know, a mining company saying, you know, oh, you know, give you whatever to write a piece of music for this, you know, Range Rover going over country or some shit like that or sorry um so but that that those type of things if it because um as we all know you know we've all been in the same the same you know, kind of ship but you know mm -hmm. kind of like those type of issues you know kind of um and we all know what the, you know the stories are and that um the issues are um out in the community so those type of things um i haven't said no yet but um there's one I'm thinking about now from what from what Troy said and what we've been talking about. So, um, yeah, otherwise it's, you know, let's go. Did you say age, stage, and what was the last one? Phase. <laughs> Phase. You know, where you're up to in your career. Like, and that's the thing. A lot of people say, oh, yes, yeah, I was talking to a lady. Oh, yes, yeah, you know, kind of blah, 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 back in the day. Um, we call it reggae. And now you're doing yeah. classical. And it's either, um, I use the term classical art music because classical is a very, as we all know, like a very structured thing. But with Nari Barrier, like, I didn't even think, before before actually Chris came over and said, come on, come on, do this thing I'm, I'm doing, you know, Nari Barrier, 
I never thought of myself as a yeah, composer. Yeah. I'm sure there's a better word for it. But, you know, kind of like, what are they called? Yeah, um, I hadn't thought of that, you know, um, I've actually been called a composer. And I think I'm really at the, even though I'm a ripe old age, I'll blast. Um, I, I think I'm, early, um, you know, early stages of this whole, what well, composition, cause it's a whole different bag to, it's, it's... Um, you know, playing. And we all understand because, like, as live musicians, we're quite happy. And I'm looking at mm-hmm. Marlene, especially Marlene, we're quite happy to go out there and, you know, stand in front of either, you know, a small crowd or yeah. one, yeah. five thousand, mm-hmm. whatever, you know, and rock and roll. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. what you do. <laughs> that's You get in the zone, you do it. Those things. Um, but this <laughs> composition's another thing. Hey? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's another thing. Yeah, so. yeah like... You know, when I first started out all those years ago, I used to get so nervous that I'd literally be shaking. You know, I'd look at, mm. I'd be on stage and I'd look at my hand and it's shaking. Mm. And I'd be up there with Glenn Spieth or at Yarbin at, at Survival at La Perouse, and my hand's shaking like that, you know. Mm. <laughs> but today, yeah, I'm yeah. Being like, I don't even see past the end of the stage anymore, mm. you know. Like you see, you look out and you see these people there, but I don't see individuals. You know, it's just mm. crowd. Mm. You know? So, um, mm. and I don't know if that's just a, for me or for anybody, whoever. You know, uh, however, but I'm I'm not the front person either. So, like mm. Tim, he has to interact. He has to see who's there. You know, mm. like you, yourself, yeah. Marlene. You know, you're that front person of your band and mm. it's that interaction draws the audience in. But for myself, my personal growth has been more of um, leaving the music aside and trust. Trust in myself that I can take the lead. I can I am forever decolonizing the approach to the colonial critic. Mm. Uh, that that programming of that. I mean, it, it's it's a hell of a thing too to work at a band where you're the only woman, mm. <laughs> and you get a case mm. out. You know, especially when when, you, when you're all baby boomers. <laughs> <laughs> but my guys, I've been lucky; they're pretty cool. And um, I've always been. I've always never thought I was ever good enough. It's taken many, 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 many years. And I've suddenly realised that, and there's so many times I was aching to burst out to say something, but I always um, felt because I didn't, I wasn't aware of uh, music theory as such, uh, mm-hmm. reading and writing. I, I had it to a degree, to a degree, but not as much as uh, one of my heroes for that, which happens to be Miss Gifford Sydney and they talking there. My, my, most of my heroes in music are Aboriginal, you know. My my hero for the blues is Savannah Doolan, you know. And if he asked me if I were to sit around a campfire with the inspirations, it'd be Savannah Doolan, Brenda Gifford, probably my mother and, well, I can't help it. I've got to say John Coltrane. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> oh, I've got to throw in Miles too. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. oh Coco Taylor and Edda Jack. Coco and Eva Jane, yeah, that's it, and mm-hmm. and Brenda Gifford. I really admired, I remember when I first came down here, I heard of Brenda, so I went looking for her. Remember, Brenda, you was working in an office somewhere down there, Darling Harbour. What was that place? Was it ever in the first? Oh, God, Marley. What, 30 years ago? Could, yeah, yeah, and back, I went yeah, looking yeah. for her. I was so excited. Yeah, going back. I was so excited to and uh, Brenda's got a very, I love her style, her, her tenor style. She's, it's really Brenda. She do, I kind of like musicians who um, who don't follow fashion monkey, you know what I mean? Everybody's trying to play like Miles Davis and John Paul, you know, like it's like just try and put uh, yourself through that thing. And, and uh, so... I'm more confident than ever now. I, I have a passion. I have, I've had it all my life for seeing live music. 
uh, you know, I've seen the animals, I've seen the yard birds, I've seen the monkeys, you know, I've seen Bill Haley in the comets. Actually, when I was 14, I went to a big rock and roll concert in uh, Milton Tennis Courts in Brisbane, and uh, I, I, uh, I spoke to Bill Haley from, from and the, the saxophonist, Rudy Popoli, Italian guy. He had a beautiful, and I looked at him and 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 um, he said, "Gee," I said to him, "Wish I could play that." Thing. I love the saxophone. Every time I hear a song, I love listening to the saxophone. He said, "Really?" He said, "You you want to play a saxophone?" Because if what I got from his it was the fact that it was because he's still from that era that it was a male dominated instrument. Mm. So he, but it's funny how I come out with that then for that time mm. in the late sixties. And, and also, Tim, I'd be really interested to hear your um, response to this. When I think, how am I going to help anybody in the world? All I can do is sing a song. And then when I'm around my music making family and hearing Annie Marlene talk about decolonizing. And listening to Brenda's history in uh, her her playing and making, and knowing Tim how passionate you are about activism, is music activism? Can it be activism? Um, yes, are yes. we activists if we're not marching on the streets? Oh, I I agree. Absolutely. It's like to me, Richard Bell. I use his quote: "I'm an artist. I'm an activist disguised as an artist." Mm. Well, I'm a musician. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm an activist disguised as a musician. But uh, I don't know. It's that music thing too. You you play music for the love of it. Different people want to be into music for different reasons. They, they they take it up, they learn it, and they don't make money. Is it? No, I'm not. I'm not, I don't want to play it anymore. I put it down because I'm not making any money. Some people want to do it to improve their sex life. Some people want to, um, you know, like. But for me, it's just in my DNA. I still. I'm an activist, but I still like to play a cover that it caught, make people happy and dance. But I think mm. above all, as you will see in a lot of songs that I do, uh, uh, with uh, its tributes to Aboriginal women heroes like Truganini, you know, Mum Shirl, and mm. also a song I wrote about Pemawoy. It, it covers a spectrum too, and, and, and you can't, it's innately within us to play that music for purposes of... Um, healing for purposes of uh, saying something that you, you, you've got to be doing and what you shouldn't be doing for the betterment of the whole community, for the betterment of, 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 of the spiritual relationship we have with the land, with everything that is, that why we exist. It's, uh, and that's another thing, because I incorporate a bit of that into my, that language, so into my blues as well so and it's and for me as a woman who better than the black panther woman to tell us that music is activism and, and the green hand band leads here what what's your thoughts on that tim is it, i know green hand band is very kind of can i say very political or very passionate about um uh your beliefs yeah. does your compositions have the, that same kind of um uh, bent. Yeah, Green Hand Band was definitely uh, purposefully, you know, wanting to say things uh, in regards to, you know, political social issues, you know, social change and things like that. And I wanted to do it in a way where it wasn't um, angsty like the Sex Pistols, but like more, <laughs> more balanced. Um, like Bob, I wanted to do it in a way that was talking to everyone. And I didn't want to do it in a way where I was just talking to other us as First Nations people, but I wanted to talk to everybody. And I, I found that's one of the reasons why I love the way Bob Marley's and Peter Tosh's lyrics <clears throat> um, sort of spoke to everybody. And that's what I wanted to do with the Green Hand Band. But I didn't want to copy uh, Bob Marley's, um, the, the, the Jamaican Caribbean style reggae. I wanted it to be bit of a mixture between that and uh, the reggae here, the Aboriginal reggae, you know, the no fix address, the, the, that desert reggae stuff. And a bit more upbeat and a bit more fun. We've got, we got a song called Garuja, which is about the whales, just the beauty of whales. Talking about that song line along the east coast, the whales make. 
And Christine Arnoux played it on, on her radio show. And she said, she described it as, it sounds, she said, it sounds very much like the wicket. And I'm like, and, I'm, and when I heard her say that, yes, because when we play that at uh, Madoff gigs, that particular song, you'll notice, or any gig, kids will come up to the front for something about that song. So Christine Arnie was actually on the stuff there. Uh, and I've said it off to the Eagles, actually, so if they want to use it, they can, if they don't. You know. <laughs> but things like that, I just wanted to make the Green Hand Band music fun, but also mm-hmm. saying that message of, you know, you know, like Common Welfare is about tyranny, um, against tyranny. And I've got that title... Common Warfare from the big book of AA. <laughs> Funnily enough. Because not, none of this that I do, none of this composition, I, I can't do compositions or or be in a band or write lyrics uh, if I didn't get sober and get on top of my drug and alcohol addiction. That's where it all started for me, my music career. Once I got sober in that rehab, then I became a music. Some music did it the other way around. <laughs> Sorry, I was just going to say, like, following on from both what Marlene and um, Tim said, the other, and this is most probably not the activism, you know, kind of like, you know, we all had our songs and that, you know, and, um, you know, I was going to say, you can't say that, um, you know, the police moments. But the thing is, the other thing is um, artistic choice. If I want to write a song, like I'm doing classical, that's a, that's a, to me that's a form of activism because this is such a um, it's a different world. Um, it is that you know I think we're essentially activists because we're actually there. We're black yeah. and we're doing it. But the other thing is artistic choice. So if I want to go and write a classical orchestra, yeah. I'll do it. That's a form of activism. And, and yeah, uh, it's about self determination. Yeah. And it's like Lillian Crombie wants to start yeah. a ballet school. And someone said to me, what, a ballet school? What, look, what, we are mm. diverse in our makeup just as much as anybody else. And that's all about being uh, as human, as individual as we like to be. To have that privilege, to have that choice, it doesn't make you any less a black fella. Because we're as diverse as anybody else. But I just want to, at the end of the day, I just want to play music too. And I, I'm happy. I'm, and I'm just moving up to classical now. Mm. And I'm not. Well, even outside of making music, as you're saying and Brenda's saying, we all can, just being a black fella is, is being an activist, walking around in the middle of Sydney, uh, you know, uh, having yarns like this. Uh, we are politicised anyway. When we put culture first, it is a decolonising thing. No matter if you're a ballet dancer or a composer or you know uh, a filmmaker or whatever, so it's it's happening anyway. Um, but yeah, it's because of the colour of your skin. Yeah, it's because of the colour of your skin. You're mm. auto, you're automatically an activist. Because yeah. you're, always, you're always fighting for that. Yeah. And Regardless that can be what you do, people. Yeah. And it, it comes out in yeah. your art form. Whatever yeah. art form that may be, it could be business, whatever. And you look at Terry Jenke, perfect for that. That's what she does. Yeah. You know? The, yourself, you're a good singer. Marlene, saxo, you know, alto and tenor, you know? Mm. Tim writes really good you know, you, you listen to all those bands that came before, Rumpy, and oh, they, yeah. weren't, they went out there to play music. Mm. You know, there's Rumpy, mm. there's Mixed Relations, there's Coloured Stone, mm. you know, all those. Hard times. You know, and, like, a, even when um, I think you were mentioning Harley and I was thinking, yep. where's the rock against racism now? Mm. You know, where's that? Darcy Cummins. Got Yarbin, great, you know, all these other festivals that we might be allowed to go and play in. But where's the ones that actually mean something? Mm. Maybe it's up to us to put them on and not white collars anymore. I don't know. Yeah. I'd love to hear what each of you think or want the future 
to look like for First Nations musos and for Blackfella composers? What do you wish um, their future to be? Troy, can I put you on the spot? First, I'm, oh, well, Brandon's got to come in town, so let's go to her. <laughs> So what we've got is um, for these, you know, talk, talking about different types of music and that and um, where, where we're at and that, um, for this kind of, um, for blackfellas to actually have, and it always for me is equity, um, we need to have a fully funded First Nations music school with all genres of music, representing including mm -hmm. classical art, music, jazz, a full orchestra and opera arm yes. and jazz wing, properly supported and career paths in place, especially for our youth and hip hop. You know, the youth seem to be, and you know, I'm showing my age, but the youth seem to um, be, you know, hip hop. That's how they're telling their stories. And online platforms. And when I say, you know, for to actually, you, you've got all these little, not little, but, you know, state as opposed to federal. And you actually I need some, oh, some leadership and um, national, fully funded, supported, then state level supported and actually have something in there. So when they have an international artist come here, we have a little black orchestra who can back them, you know. When we have a jazz musician, you know, you've seen people like, what's his name? Herbie. Uh, Barton. Willie Barton. You know, he's doing the jazz Willie. stuff Willie. on the ditch. With, you know, at the International Music, what do you call them? Jazz Festival, Marlon. Mm -hmm. And so all these genres, and you know, especially youth, um, hip-hop, and actually have access to, you know, so they have a little room so they can go and, you know, what do you call them? That's how we all learn, you know. We had a little room in a place where we could all go and jam together. And apart from, you know, being COVID, but that's why I'm saying online platforms. So all those different, you know, all those different areas we're talking about and then, you know, the actual... As you know, for our given communities, um, in the large, we actually have a federally funded, then state funded, and fully supported. If you can have conservatoriums that are, you know, um, conservatoriums attached to a mm. city university, then you can actually have um, an independent, and that's the other thing independent, and I don't know, like I'm not up in that, you know. Um, but yeah, actually having having a space and a place, and I think it's Mughal, you know, first people's first. I just love yeah. that. <laughs> it's easy, and I remember it. Um, first people's first, but in that kind of thing. And and the, you know what I'd love to see exactly is uh, this is me kind of going on, but you know, a first or second violin in the Sydney Symphony Orchestra, um, an Aboriginal jazz. Purely jazz, you know, jazz takes different, many different forms. Open the um, International Jazz Festival. It's there, it's for us, you know, and, um, yeah, so that type of thing, everything from country music through to jazz and everything in between. But actually, when I say support, actually being properly funded. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, what an answer. Yeah, I, down the road. Imagine we can go and what, see a oh, symphony, yeah. an orchestra. And it's all Aboriginal people. That's all I really, we could all see that in our minds. But what annoys yeah. me is no. who are the gatekeepers of getting this thing happen? And they are all... Well, this is just an yeah, idea, well, you know. Kind of like, but that's, yeah, yeah, well, that's where it should be. I totally agree. It should agree. be there now. But you got, you got now. people, yeah. you got people who are in these positions who are, you got the white people who are gatekeepers. And mm. and they, who have no knowledge of what's going on in the community, they uh, you know like Alpha Amcos are ringing me to ask me why, how can they reach Aboriginal people, you know, and the Aboriginal people, are, you know, it's it's you know institutions of racism go across the board even in the industry because that's what's going to be about in my common ground blues that. You know, having access and having, pri having the privilege and having the connection, if you like. I said, well, you, you've got to be doing the connection because 
My father had to do, only got gigs when he put on a Pacific Island shirt and had to say he was any other race but Aboriginal. Very stuff. That's why my, why my docos call Common Ground Blues because that's what the, the blacks were coming through the back doors because they, they wanted the music, you know, and then they had to go out that way. Same stuff happened here. My father did it. The, the Pitt sisters changed their name to Americanized name. Even black Americans, well, Kudos to them because they the the, the 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 birth of modern music as it stands today, right up to R and B hip hop, came from black music. Come mm -hmm. across the the Africa to uh, America, connected by bones, you know, from the cotton fields to the uh, spirituals to field hollers to spirituals to gospel to blues to jazz. To, uh, but anyhow, what I'm trying to say is uh, there are people who are. Uh, they are not really connected to the grassroots of, of, of the black fellow music history of this country. And some of those people, I'm sorry, I will say it, but uh, these people who are making decisions for us, who've got, who've got the privileges of, to be in those positions, to handpick people, and half of them are their favourite musicians and what have you, and they're getting all the jobs, and they're, and they're not really, they don't even know black fellow music history of this country. And that's why certain big, huge funding bodies coming under investigation because of that. Yeah, I'm going to say it right here now on this video. <laughs> and um, because, and that's that's where these these wonderful ideas that we all think about, Brenda. I totally agree with you. Um, and how they're going to come to the fore when we've got these things, we've got these barricades in our way with with uh, the so-called modern day Jackie Jackie. Mm. Brenda, what did you call that place? You said you said a title for it. I think if you write it down, if we all write it down, then there's behind. Graham. Tell us what what it was called again. You know, freedom, a freedom access equity. You know that stuff. We will we will understand. But it's just like you can go freedom, and you can have it in all different languages. I don't know. Look, I'm just shooting. It's just an idea, and I'm sure we've had all had similar ideas, but in this day and age, you know, it is 2021. I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm just pushing ideas, but, you know, um, I really think it's time, especially when you see the t real, we've all seen the real talent in the community. Man, mm. just if you could ha harness some of that bloody that's real talent in the youth, and then, you know, tw 10 years' time we might have. You, you don't know. It's just... um. Yeah, that maybe the committee's had their first yeah. meeting right now. <laughs> I put my yeah. hand up, it's, and it's, I'm sure Mugglin would be there yeah. with wonderful support and guidance. And you know, Kazum and Eora, there are jigsaw pieces already happening, and our beautiful, wonderful leaders and elders yeah. like you four, uh, mm. and Annie Marlene, you're talking about investing in the. In our young people. Yeah. Yeah. And can I say what Mugler's mm. doing is probably a lot, than what I've seen lately, is a lot more than these so called big institutions of funding, supposedly mm. for black fellow music. Them fellas sitting up there, and they are real. They are here. They, they are very assimilated, colonised blacks, some of them. And they're sitting up there. They're pulling the strings. They, 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 there's no real proper uh, outreach to the communities. We always have to compromise ourselves. We always have to follow the white footprint. A mm. And the white gatekeepers pick these black fellows. You've got to go by the white footprint to, mm. to get, up, get there up there with what, what Brenda was talking about. And that's a big mm. problem. That's a huge problem. If anything, I want to say to anybody at the, any, any um, aspiring young musicians coming mm. out now, know your history with black fellow music. Know your history, learn it, yeah. find out, you know. Yeah, you need to know where, you, where it yeah. came from so you can yeah. move forward. But what does that, that mean? Knowledge. What does it mean when we say we are the oldest living um, culture, people of culture in the world? We are the oldest. What does that mean? What was mm. the footprint that caused us to survive for thousands and thousands of years? It was about that. It was about that black footprint that permeated every aspect of our lives including the music we want to perform and deliver and, and, mm. and to be instrumental in making the world a better place, you know. So you, you, have, a, you have a responsibility to pay respect your, to your 
to, to your point, your elders, past musicians, past musicians, because that's what that's what distinguishes you as a blackfell in the first place. Because your elders were your institutions of learning, and in this case, music and music history. I'm telling all you young fellows, you, you go about learning about Warumpi Band. You learn about hard times from Victoria. You learn about mm. the Mill Sisters from the Torres Strait in Darwin. You learn about Lois Olney from. You learn about Olive Knight from the Kimberley. You know. You, you learn about mm. Google Brothers and, and, and George, Dulcy Pitt, also known as George, George Lee, and I could go on and on. Yeah, like, um, um, As, uh, what's her name, Wilger and... and um, Wilma Redding. No, no, the country outcasts. Yeah, yeah, oh, you know? yeah. Harry. Harry, Harry Williams Harry and, and Wilger. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Wilger Williams. Phenomenal. Phenomenal yeah. they were. And Candy, yeah. the brother there. Oh, yeah. what a deadly rock and roller. And Vic Sims, you know? Mm -hmm. Candy Williams. He yeah. was a phenomenal rock and roller. Mm. He was real good looking too, just quite. <laughs> I remember seeing him back in the day. <laughs> real good and old uh, Charlie Richards, my uncle Charlie, he was a saxophonist. <laughs> Mm. Another see, it's just me and you, Tim. We're the only non saxophonist. It's been a takeover. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think on that note, too, yeah. I would love to thank everybody for um, their time, their wisdom, and their passion, and your music. Because uh, what better thing, no more better thing to leave behind and to implant in young people than the music that you all make and the spirit in, that you all make it in. So thank you to Brenda Gifford, Troy Russell, Tim Gray and the deadly Annie Marlene Cummins for sharing part of your making in your life today. So thank you. Thanks, Brad. Oh, so good. This, yeah, thank you. love it.